Hello, chemistry students. Today we're going to be talking about atomic forces, and more specifically, the forces of interaction between charged particles within the atom. So recently, we've talked a lot about trends on the periodic table, uh, trends that we can follow going from left to right, top to bottom, about size and reactivity. But we haven't really explained why these trends are the way they are. But a lot of it can be explained by an equation called Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law helps us determine the attractive and repulsive forces felt by charged particles, uh, like the protons and the electrons. So uh, the force acting between two particles, represented by the F here, can be either positive or negative. A negative force uh, results in a force of attraction between particles, and a positive force is a force of repulsion between particles. And we can kind of already predict where this is going if we Think about what the charges of protons and electrons are. Protons are positive and electrons are negative. So we can expect that protons and electrons having opposite charges are going to attract each other, but then protons and protons and electrons and electrons are going to repel each other, having like forces. So let's see how that maps to this equation. So we have our force here. Uh, negative is attraction, positive is repulsion. We have a constant, k, which we don't need to worry about. We're not actually going to be using this equation to solve any math problems. More, we're using this to uh, look at the relationships between the variables. So we have k, it's a constant, don't worry about it. And then q1 and q2 represent the charges of the two particles that we're focusing on. So uh, kind of like I said before, um, like, like charged particles are going to repel and unlike charged particles are going to attract. Well, a positive times a negative is going to give us a negative, which is a force of attraction, versus two positives or two negatives, which is going to give us a positive force, which is going to be a force of repulsion. The other component to this is the r squared on the bottom. This represents the distance between the two particles. And you can see that it's in the denominator. So the bigger this distance gets, the more you're dividing this whole term by, and the smaller the force is going to get. So the farther the two particles are away from each other, the less force they're going to feel. And all of this makes sense if you consider atoms to, or charged particles within atoms to be like magnets. The, the closer you pull or closer you put two magnets together, the more you feel that force of attraction between them. And the more you pull them apart, the weaker and weaker that attraction gets. And it's like sort of an exponential effect, like having them really close to each other is going to be a really strong attraction. But the more you pull it out, the, the weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker that force gets. Um, same thing for charged particles in atoms. Um, so the this can be summarized in a few ways. The greater the charge, uh, the more force between them. So if we have like plus one and minus one, that's going to be one force of attraction, but plus two and minus two is going to give us a much bigger force. So the stronger the charges, the higher the charges, the stronger the force, whether that be attractive or repulsive. Um, and then also the greater the distance, the weaker the force, or the shorter the distance, the stronger the force. And like I said before, two of the same charge, like protons and protons or electrons and electrons, will always be a force of repulsion. So in summary, there's an inverse relationship between force and distance, meaning as, as distance goes down, force goes up, or as force goes down, uh, distance goes up, vice versa. Um, and there's a direct relationship between force and charge. The bigger these Q values get, the stronger the force is going to be, whether that's a force of attraction or a force of repulsion. So now let's see how this applies to our periodic trends. So one of the main trends we focused on was the sizes of the atoms on the periodic table. And we saw that there were different trends for going up and down a column, uh, up and down a group, versus across uh, a period. And um, we might have noticed that as we go down a column, down a group, that the size gets bigger. And while that might seem obvious because they're getting more protons and they're getting more massive, it actually has more to do with the electrons. So most of the atom's volume is due to the electron cloud. Uh, you could think about the nucleus as being a really like small, dense like marble in the center of the atom, and then the electron cloud being this kind of like big, fluffy uh, cloud that the marble is in the center of. And the electron cloud, like I said, makes up most of the volume. So most of our size stuff is going to be related to the um, electron shells. 
So as we go from lithium to sodium, they're in the same group. This is the next element in the, in the row below. We notice that uh, we get a new shell of electrons. So lithium has two shells, whereas sodium has three. And this makes a lot of sense when we consider the size of the atom increasing, because as we add a new layer of electrons, we're going to be adding more repulsion of valence electrons from what we call shielding electrons. Shielding electrons are all of the inner shell electrons, the inner core electrons. And we call them shielding electrons because if we consider the balances of forces acting on the outside shell, on the valence shell, well, first, we have a force of attraction to the protons in the nucleus. So uh, both lithium and sodium are going to have uh, protons in the center that are pulling on all of the electrons in all of the various shells. But if we consider the most far out shell, which is going to kind of determine the overall uh, radius of the element, this electron is both being attracted to the nucleus and then also repelled by all of the electrons in the center. So these two rings of electrons um, in these inner shells are going to repel this one electron in the outer shell. Same thing for the lithium here, but lithium has one less shell of repulsion. So this electron is not going to get pushed as far away from the nucleus as it is going to be in the case of sodium. So every time you add a new shell of electrons, you increase the number of shielding electrons, and therefore you increase the distance of the valence electrons from the nucleus because of that uh, increased repulsive force. And then a good way to compare the elements within the same period uh, or row is by determining something called the effective nuclear charge. This is a number that represents the strength of the nucleus. And you can think about it in terms of like how many protons an electron in the outer shell of an atom is feeling the full force of. So there's a pretty simple equation you can use to calculate the effective nuclear charge, abbreviated as ENC. If you take the number of protons and you subtract the number of shielding electrons from it, you're going to get a number. And then this number you can compare between two elements and figure out which one has a stronger pull on its nucleus. And the reason this equation is the way it is, is because it's kind of representing a balance of force. So if you think about a valence electron in the outer shell, it's going to be attracted to the nucleus because of all the protons, but then it's also going to be repelled by all of the inner shell electrons. So if we figure out what the difference is between the pull to the nucleus and the push from the inner shells, we can figure out how much overall attraction there is to the, to the, to the nucleus of the atom. And just as a reminder, shielding electrons are the core shell electrons, or basically anything that aren't the valence, anything that aren't the outermost shell of electrons. So let's compare two elements here, uh, lithium and beryllium. If I look at lithium on the periodic table as the atomic number of three, which means it has three protons, and if we look at its Bohr model, we can see that it has two shielding electrons, two core shell electrons. So three minus two is going to give us an effective nuclear charge of one which means that the one valence electron of lithium is feeling the full pull of a single proton. Um, and that's like sort of the net pull after we've considered both the canceling out of the forces of attraction and repulsion within the atom. Now let's compare that to beryllium. Beryllium is uh, element number four, atomic number four, which means it has four protons. However, lithium and beryllium are in the same row. So they have the same number of shells and therefore have the same number of shielding electrons. So as you go across uh, a period, you're increasing in the amount of attraction from the protons, but the number of shielding electrons, the amount of repulsion from the inner shells is staying the same. So if we calculate it, we have four minus two, and now we have an effective nuclear charge of two, which means the one valence electron of beryllium is feeling the full force of attraction of two protons. And that's why beryllium ends up getting smaller compared to lithium, because even though it has more mass, the balance of forces is more uh, favored in the direction of the pull from the nucleus for beryllium, because the amount of push from the inner shell electrons is the same for beryllium and lithium, but beryllium has more protons in the center, which means that there's more attractive force to the center. So uh, uh, that was how we explain the overall um, trends for size. So remember, as we go down a period, we are increasing in size. Or sorry, down a group, we are increasing in size. And as we go across a period, we are decreasing in size.
So another physical property of atoms that is going to be really important to chemistry and will also help us explain the reactivity of the alkali metals that we saw. Um, if you all recall, as you go down the alkali metal groups, the, the most left uh, column on the periodic table, we saw that they got more and more reactive. Well, this is related to the idea of something called first ionization energy. So this refers to the amount of energy needed to remove a single valence electron from an atom, turning it into what we call an ion, which is a charged atom with unequal protons and electrons. We're going to focus on the idea of ions a lot more next week, but you can think about ions kind of like you thought about isotopes where uh, you have differing amount of neutrons. In ions, you have differing amount of electrons, but something can turn into an ion, whereas the isotopes don't really change into each other. So for lithium, for example, if lithium was to lose a single electron, it would then have two electrons and three protons, which would give it an overall positive charge. Um, and sort of the same thing with sodium, since it has one electron in its outer shell to lose. But we'll talk more about that later. So if we want to compare the first ionization energy of lithium and sodium, we need to think about Coulomb's law. Because once, once we go from one row, one period, to the next, and we're adding another shell of electrons, our valence electron is going to get further and further away from the nucleus due to the repulsion of the inner shells and just due to having to put it somewhere else. Like the electrons are just gonna get farther and farther away the more we add because our cloud is gonna get bigger and bigger. And the electrons on the edge of the cloud in the valence shell are gonna get further away. And if we think about Coulomb's law, we saw that there was an inverse relationship between the force and the distance. So the farther the electron gets away from the nucleus, the weaker the force of attraction acting on that electron is going to be. So in the case of lithium versus sodium, we'll find that lithium has a much higher first ionization energy than sodium because the distance between its valence electron and the nucleus is going to be much closer than the distance of a valence electron to the nucleus of sodium. And therefore, the force of attraction is going to be stronger in lithium. And if the force of attraction is stronger, that means we're going to have to put in more energy to pull it away. And then if we want to compare elements in a row, we can relate this back to the effective nuclear charge. Because as we go from left to right on the periodic table, we saw that the effective nuclear charge was increasing. So uh, beryllium had an effective nuclear charge of 2, whereas lithium had an effective nuclear charge of 1, which means that the pull of the nucleus is stronger in beryllium. And that also causes the size to be smaller. So if I consider the valence shell electrons for beryllium, they're going to be closer to the nucleus than they are going to be in lithium. So in this case, beryllium will have a higher first ionization energy than lithium will because the distance from the valence electron to the nucleus is smaller. And that force is going to be stronger, and therefore we're going to have to put more energy in to pull them off. And that is all I have to talk about today, so I'll see you in the next one.